and, and Judge Evans, the dissenter, said no. There's not even a single reported instance of, of voter uh, uh, impersonation here. Right? And Posner said, oh, but I, I think that's actually evidence that it does promote the state's interest. There's no, there's no in, there being no instance of prior impersonation shows just how difficult it would be to detect impersonation and therefore how much more effective it is to use a prophylactic measure to make sure that nobody is coming forward and claiming to be somebody else. Right? Another factual issue, is this imposing a burden on people who want to vote in the state? And Judge Evans says, of course it is. Think how difficult it is to get identification if you're somebody of limited means and you don't even bother to, to drive a car. Right? Then you have the, the hassle of going to get some ID that's going to deter you from voting. And Posner said, well, I don't think there's any, any burden. I, I, one reason I think that is I don't see a single individual plaintiff uh, voter in the case. It's only the Democratic Party. If it burdened individual voters, they would come forward. Right? Now, because the judges were having this kind of, of factual disagreement, we might think that values were influencing them in the third way I'm going to describe here as a subconscious influence on cognition. Right? Here the idea would be that the majority judges and, and the dissenting judge were all honestly trying to apply the law contrary to the, the subconscious partisan motivation view. Nevertheless, what they understood the law to require was being influenced by their values, right? not though as, a, as a, one of the sources that they would be using to form a moral theory about what the law means, but rather as a subconscious influence on their perception of what these contested facts were. Right? Now here is where the cultural cognition theory comes in. The cultural cognition theory could explain how values would operate as a subconscious influence on their cognition. Right? Cultural cognition refers to the tendency of people to adopt beliefs about the risks and benefits of putatively dangerous activities that fit their cultural appraisals of those activities. Right? There are a variety of mechanisms involved, but essentially it's less costly, psychologically speaking, to believe that behavior you think is honorable is also beneficial for society and conduct that you think is dishonorable is dangerous for society than vice versa. Right? So people who have relatively individualistic values tend to be skeptical about environmental risks like global warming, nuclear power risks, because they know that accepting the claim of those risks, or at least subconsciously understand that acceptance of those claims of risk could lead to restrictions of markets, private orderings, business, industry, things that people with individualistic values tend to like. People who have egalitarian values, in contrast, tend to see commerce, industry, markets as sources of unjust forms of social disparity. And for them, it's very congenial to believe then that, that, that that kind of activity does cause harms for society that justify regulating those activities. In research that the Cultural Cognition Project, a, a team of researchers of which I'm a member and also Jeff Cohen uh, is also a member, has shown that this kind of dynamic explains conflict over a wide range of risk issues from global climate change to domestic terrorism, from school shooting to the, the controversy over vaccination of school girls against HPV. Right? Now, research that I've done with another one of the Cultural Cognition Project members, Don Brayman, an anthropologist, also suggests that cultural cognition can cause conflict on legally consequential facts. Right? So in, in one paper, we showed that people who have relatively hierarchical cultural dispositions disagree with people who have relatively egalitarian dispositions about facts in potentially controversial self-defense cases. Right? So if you have a, a, a battered woman who kills her husband, her abusive husband in his sleep, hierarchists are inclined to disbelieve, egalitarians to believe that he actually posed a threat, that the woman believed he posed a threat. Right? That 
she couldn't really escape, it wasn't an option, or that she suffered from some kind of psychological impairment of her perceptions because of battered woman syndrome. Right? But if the defendant is a beleaguered commuter like Bernard Gatz, who shoots an African American teenager who's panhandling, then it's the hierarchists who are going to believe that the, the same parallel sets of pro-defendant claims, the egalitarians who are going to disbelieve them. Right? Now in another paper that we just, just did, another study we did, we found that people's cultural dispositions can also cause them to disagree about the, the, the risks that are shown in a video of a high-speed car chase that's filmed from inside the pursuing police cruiser. The, the U.S. Supreme Court, in the case of, case of Scott B. Harris, said that no reasonable juror could watch that tape and not conclude that the fleeing driver po posed a risk sufficiently lethal to justify the use of deadly force, the ramming of his car at 100 miles an hour, right, by the police. Right? But we showed the tape to about 1,400 people, and, and we found that it was white males who have very hierarchical and individualistic values were most likely to perceive what the court did in the tape, right? whereas people who have relatively egalitarian and communitarian values of either gender or either race, much more likely to form a, a, form a different view of the risks after watching the tape. Right? So what I want to suggest is that maybe the disagreement in the, the Crawford case is a result of this kind of cultural cognition, right? That the factual issues in that case really are uncertain. The evidence is ambiguous. You know, what do we make of the fact that there never has been a case of somebody being caught imperson impersonating a voter at the polls? Does it mean no one's ever done it, right? As, as Judge Evans said, or does it mean that it's just too hard to catch people doing it and therefore the state is justified in using a prophylactic means to prevent it? ID, which Judge Posner said, right? What do we make of the fact that there's not a, a single, single individual voter plaintiff in the case, that there really isn't any burden on voters, Judge Posner's view, or that maybe just the the burden of bringing a lawsuit <laughs> exceeds any potential benefit an individual might get out of casting a single vote, which I think Judge Posner would tell us is irrational anyway, since you never can influence the election by your single vote. You'd only expect a collection of voters to find the burden of suing to be, to be, be outweighed by the expected benefit of getting that burden removed from big classes of voters, or at least, you know, that's what I, I see, but how do I know what to see here, right? Which, which story, which, which collection of conjectures will I find more congenial, right? Maybe the judges in the case found one set of empirical conjectures congenial and the other another because of their cultural predispositions. Now, I suspect because we're so blue as we were told at the the beginning of the, the session, that many of you at this point are probably saying, come on, you know, what are you saying? We know that, that Judge Posner's account of the facts was just a rationalization of the outcome he wanted, which supported the Republicans and went against the Democrats. That is, I think probably many of you do find it instinctively more plausible to believe, consistent with the, the, the self-conscious partisan motivation account of the ideology thesis, that they were just picking the result that suited their political preferences than that they were influenced by cultural cognition. Right? And in fact, Judge Evans, in his dissent, said exactly that. He said, come on, you know, to stop pussyfooting around, I think he said. It was a direct quote, something like this. You know what's going on here. Now, maybe he's right, but here's one thing. <laughs> that kind of dismissive reaction is exactly what cultural cognition would predict on the part of those who have cultural predispositions that would orient them toward the set of facts that Judge Evans found convincing. Right? The phenomenon of naive realism refers to the tendency of people to recognize that those who disagree with them on contested factual matters are probably motivated subconsciously by their political commitments. That's the realism part without realizing that their own 
factual perceptions are also likely to be motivated by their political commitments. 